Hello and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and I'm talking to leading voices in Bitcoin and macroeconomics about their origin stories, Bitcoin headlines and news topics, and this movement to fix the world by fixing the money. This podcast does not provide financial advice. Before I share this week's episode, here are some messages from my sponsors who make this show possible. First of all, are you ready for Bitcoin 2023? I certainly am. This year's Bitcoin conference was absolutely amazing. I got to spend a week in Miami with tens of thousands of Bitcoiners from around the world. And I'm so grateful that I had the chance to anchor Bitcoin Magazine's live desk and MC the main stage. If you missed the event, you can catch all three days of incredible Bitcoin content over on Bitcoin Magazine's YouTube channel. And also, it's never too early to start making plans to attend the next conference. Bitcoin 2023 tickets are already available and super early bird rates do not last long. So you can visit b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and secure your pass before prices increase. This show is also powered by OKCoin, my favorite place to DCA without the crazy fees. OKCoin recently launched an amazing initiative called Crypto for All, which is aimed at democratizing knowledge and access to Bitcoin. OKCoin is one of the fastest growing and most secure global cryptocurrency exchanges that serves all your needs for Bitcoin and is committed to investing in educational content, funding crypto developers and entrepreneurs from underrepresented groups, and helping more diverse talent work on crypto ecosystem projects and careers. OKCoin has actually contributed more than a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs and counting, has one of the most active lightning nodes and recently launched sats mode. To open an account and start stacking, head to okcoin.com slash Natalie and get $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. I'm excited to share my guest today is Elise Colleen. She is the founder and managing partner of Stillmark, which is a Bitcoin venture capital firm. And she has invested in some of the biggest companies in the space. Here's Elise. Well, Elise, thank you so much for joining me. I had a great time with you on the news desk at Bitcoin conference. I just want to say you did an amazing job. So maybe, uh, you know, some anchoring is in your future. <laughs> well, I, I was trying to just copy and reflect what you were doing. So um, I'll improve each time we're on the desk together. Well, I can't wait to talk about actually some of the things you brought up because I thought you were so insightful on that panel. But first, uh, I just want to start this episode like I do all of them, kind of go all the way back and hear about your upbringing and how you came to Bitcoin. So I read that you're from Daly City. You're from near the Silicon Valley area and that your grandfather was an entrepreneur and that sort of impacted you. So can you tell me a little bit about sort of your upbringing, your childhood and your family? Yes. So, um, wow. So I, well, I'm from San Francisco, so I was born in Daly City. I wonder if I just like doxed myself, basically South San Francisco. That's where Daly City is. Um, But I'm one of the few people that's actually from San Francisco, family from San Francisco. And so I did grow up um, you know, around Silicon Valley and sort of saw it um, emerge as a culture um, beyond being just, um, you know, a set of businesses. And so that's a bit of my background. As you said, my grandfathers were both entrepreneurs and I grew up working with one of them that had a business in South San Francisco around construction um, and large scale plumbing. So really, um, you know, real work, work, right. Blue collar work. Um, but he ran the business. So that's different than, um, yeah. And I got to see that. And so what I thought I was learning from him during that time was entrepreneurship. But what I realized, um, in with 2020, um, vision is that I was actually learning how to, um, sort of help founders, actualize their vision and how to find joy in supporting people um, executing on their dream. And so that's the opportunity that, you know, we have at Stillmark really is sort of backing founders that have a different vision of the world, an idea of how to get there and how to advance culture in that way. And then our work is to help them accelerate that. So we're just trying to partner with people that would get there without us and try to help them get there quicker. So when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you even have a a sense for venture capital when you were younger? Well, definitely not. So I thought, I mean, there was a million things that I wanted to do. I thought I would be an entrepreneur like my grandfather, but I cycled through all the sorts of science-based aspirations that young kids have. So everything from 
um, you know, astronaut to, to lab scientist. And, um, and, you know, before I went into venture capital, actually, I um, explored the sciences a bit. So I have a background in re research and statistics, and specifically looking at inflammatory disease processes um, and how to mitigate them. And so that's what I did um, before going to business school and before getting into venture capital, kind of accidentally stumbling into it. Wow. That's really interesting. Wait, I want to hear a little bit more about that. And also I thought you studied psychology. That's right. So I studied health psychology. So what I was specifically looking at was how cognitive or behavioral interventions could impact disease outcome and inflammatory oh, wow. disease outcome. So I looked at things like my, my master's thesis was on a condition called, um, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I also looked at various forms of cardiovascular disease and um, how to intervene, how to help folks, um, you know, change the course um, of their illness or of wellness. Why were you interested in that? Well, I mean, this is a really, so uh, because I was a reader. And so one of the things that I, I read a book on fire sciences. This is like way out there when I was an undergrad. And in that book, it talked a bit about um, uh, firefighters and the risk, the on the job risk of firefighters. And actually what was astounding to me was that, um, you know, the primary cause of death in the fire department in that time was um, heart attack, a cardiovascular event on the job. It wasn't it wasn't fire. It wasn't um, car accidents. That was number two, I think, if I remember correctly. But it was cardiovascular events, and so um, I, you know, I wanted to know more. And so I did undergraduate research on that topic, which led me to a curiosity around inflammatory disease processes wow. and sort of um, the uh, the sort of least intrusive way to impact the outcome of um, you know someone's health. Were you always super health conscious or just trying to find ways to make sure that you were at, at your kind of optimum performance or kind of, did you think about your mental health a lot? I think, well, so from a mental health perspective with first responders and the fire department to relate it back to that, what we, one area that I um, was involved in was traumatic stress response. Mm -hmm. And so this is probably not super interesting, I imagine to your audience, but we, um, I did spend time looking at how to sort of support coping for folks that would be exposed repeatedly to traumatic stress. So that's first responders, like police officers, firefighters, mm -hmm. um, or folks in our, in our military. Um, and that, that was a, a briefer period of time, but something that I did, I don't think that I was necessarily, uh, um, you know, anchored on the health component, but more on, um, on, you know, something that I didn't expect to find in the data. And so there was a curiosity that was catalyzed by that realization that heart attack was something that was happening to these, you know, seemingly healthy guys. And what did that mean? And what could we do to make it better? You know, I find this really interesting. And I, I wanted to ask that because, being a reporter, first of all, I spend a lot of time with first responders or I would go to the scene where they were responding. And I can't imagine how stressful that job is both physically and mentally, but also just being a news reporter. I think back on the last 10 years of my life and thinking about how much you're around sort of tragedy and negative news and death and destruction and like how much that really impacts you and then ultimately impacts your health. And I would have many colleagues that would go on stress leave. And I didn't start to really take care of that until I was a little bit older. Cause I think in our twenties, we really push ourselves, right. We're just like, I'm going to stay up late. I'm going to wake up early. Uh, I'm going to go, go, go. But it's, it's interesting. Cause as I get older, I appreciate that correlation between stress or your mental health and actually your body. And I think Bitcoin has actually given me a lot of peace and health. <laughs> it's true. Yes, it's true. Exactly that. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I mean, part of what I found in the with firefighters was that there was an understanding or like a respect that they gave themselves and one another around having space to um, away from the stress that you would expect to have 
in response to a traumatic event. So, um, you know, the intuition of folks working in this field was good for how to take care of their health in the short term. And so I, you know, that was a happy finding that was counterintuitive. So, you know, I'm one that's kind of curious about um, the way things work, what we can do to improve upon where we're at. And of course, working around entrepreneurs is a really good way to sort of entertain um, and, you know, make use of those, those, that curious nature, I suppose. So how did your career pivot from sort of the health and psychology side to venture capital? And you said you, you got an MBA, right? Right. So actually um, what happened was, you know, so I'm, I'm an optimist. A lot of us are in the venture and the Bitcoin space. Um, and what I realized when I went into further education after I got my master's, I was pursuing a PhD and the research work start to felt really isolated from actually having an impact. And then I started to look at and question the incentive system that exists in academia. There's a lot of pressure to publish. What you publish is read by a really small group of folks. And it just felt um, for me not to be a match with the values I grew up in seeing my grandfather, for instance, contribute to the building of San Francisco. Um, you know, even if that was through, uh, you know, doing the plumbing for a ballpark, right? I had, I was used to seeing, um, you know, like a tangible result of work. And so academia, that was just a part of, that's a part of my core values. And um, academia started to feel different from that. And so I dropped out of my PhD program and thought I would end up pursuing an entrepreneurial path like my grandfather. And I went to get my MBA to learn um, the financial skills that I had sort of lacked. I had, you know, I had studied stats, I'd, looked, I'd studied math, but not from a financial perspective. And so that was the purpose of the MBA. Um, and during my MBA, I started networking with venture capitalists, thinking that I needed this network to help fund, you know, what I would do next. And, um, you know, it, someone proposed to me that given my background in stats and research, it might make sense to try the other side of the table and to get into venture capital. And so I took a 10 week internship and that was 10 years ago. So they, they were right that that was the thing you know, for me to do that would be rewarding and that where I could also, um, you know, contribute value. And so um, I'm happy they challenged me to consider it. Can you break down just in the simplest way possible, what is venture capital and how does it really work? Because, and I ask this because I feel like we talk a lot about easy money in terms of fiat when we talk about Bitcoin and this idea that because of easy money, because of easy credit and our, um, our patterns of going into further and further debt, we sort of fund a lot of things that we probably wouldn't with a hard money standard or under, you know, real capitalism. So how does venture capital play into that? So, well, okay. So venture capital, of course, um, is the practice of investing in the company's equity with the expectation that it can appreciate. And the way that you produce a return in venture capital is very different from what you see um, with investing in tokens, for example, in that in order for someone in venture capital or an investor in a VC fund to make money, the underlying companies that make up the portfolio have to have created value and have to be recognized for creating that value in that their enterprise value goes up. Um, and so it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, um, you know, there's no magic to it. It's not, um, you know, you put money in, you get money out. It's not like that, really. It's just about sort of giving more resources to founders that have a plan for how to increase the value of their company. And the best way to do that, of course, is to provide value for the market for your end users or for the businesses that use your product. But then you also have to capture some of that value, right? Like a sliver. And, and that helps you grow your business, including from the perspective of increasing the valuation, the value that um, the market gives your business. And venture capital is about supporting that. So it's, um, I think it's a lot less you know, when you actually look at the practice, it's probably a lot less um, mysterious than people think. And it's, it's, you know, I don't, I feel like it might come off sometimes as, um, you know, like 
a, like a sexy or flashy business. And I think it's, it's really not. It's um, I think of our, I think of Stillmark and good venture capitalists as service providers for the founders that they back and for the investors that back them. So basically with a venture capital firm, you have a certain amount of capital, you have a certain amount of money and, and tech entrepreneurs, they can pitch you, right? They can say, Hey, I have this idea. This is why I need funding. Um, I have a girlfriend kind of going through the process and she's a founder and she's trying to get, you know, VC funding and they go through rounds. Is that, can you kind of break down sort of the process of, of how it works and how maybe valuations are, um, are created? Because sometimes I feel like we hear about companies and they have these massive valuations, but they're not actually making any revenue. And I think it's so confusing for some people. I, I, I think about some of the, the, you know, startups and in, in the tech space or social media where I'm like, wow, they're valued at this, but are they really generating that kind of revenue? And how does that work from a valuation standpoint? So there's two buckets, I think that valuations fall into one would be metrics driven. So where you can look at the company and understand how, if they continue to grow, the public markets will value their, their revenue basically. So it's metrics driven, but then there's another bucket, which I think you're alluding to here, which is that that, uh, VCs will sometimes look at a company's market the company's position within that market, and then the founding team's ability to execute or to make the most on their position. And so that's where you can sort of get to these valuations that seem hard to justify by revenue. Stillmark's practice in the way that I grew up in venture capital was um, really to sort of be anchored on a company's metrics. And the reason for that is that we want founders to always be in a comfortable position when raising subsequent financings, Mm -hmm. where what can get really dangerous, I think, for founders is when you've raised at a high valuation that's not metrics-based, and then you go out to raise your subsequent financing that's also not going to be based on metrics. And then you can get into a position where you have to sell a lot of equity in the company um, just to sort of get enough capital to maintain the business. So the healthiest way to grow a business um, when you're raising venture capital is to raise subsequent financings at an increasingly higher and higher valuation. And if you're kind of over your skis in terms of valuation um, and metrics, you know, that becomes difficult to do. And so what, what we're looking to do when we back a founder is always put them in a position to succeed over the long term. Um, and we try to think less about optimizing for the short term. And where does the capital come from? Like at all these big VC firms that we hear about, where is the capital actually coming from? So we raise capital from various types of investors. So first, the type of um, fundraising that most traditional VCs, most VCs and generals do and do is to raise money from accredited investors. Um, and that can that's comprised of a variety of groups. And so for Stillmark, we have investors that are individuals, family offices. We have um, our first capital came from all Bitcoin OGs, really people wow. that deeply knew the tech had built up family offices um, by their success in the field and thought that a venture capital firm could be additive to Bitcoin's progress in helping advance companies you know, that could also help progress Bitcoin, Bitcoin adoption at the very least. Um, But we also work with endowments, so university endowments and other sorts of institutions. Um, But what's been really sort of, you know, like the secret sauce or magic of Snowmark, I think, is that Bitcoin's network, the diversity of the network is reflected in our investors. And so we have people that have joined us, um, you know, as part of the team. That's how I think of our investors as part of the extended team who, you know, not just are hoping for a return on their capital, which of course they are, but are also hoping for the companies that we back, um, you know, to increase Bitcoin's utility, to get Bitcoin into more hands, to make Bitcoin easier to use, even if that use is just um, as a store of value. And so to have you know, people in our network and in our investor set that are mission driven, in addition to being, um, you know, ROI driven, that's been really important and helpful for our founders too. So how did you actually come to discover Bitcoin? I would imagine that being in Silicon Valley, a lot of people were talking about it way back when. So you're probably an OG yourself. (laughs) 
So, well, I was in Los Angeles. Um, so I was working in venture capital. I was doing a lot of deep tech stuff um, and infrastructure. I was looking a lot at cybersecurity, um, like early machine learning stuff, early data science stuff, and cloud networking and enterprise adoption of a hybrid model. So, and by the by the way, at the time, the question was, you know, will the cloud uh, total addressable market ever exceed a couple billion dollars, which is just crazy to think about now, but that's what we were thinking about in 2011, 2012, 2013. Um, and so when I found Bitcoin, it was as a technology. So a lot of people discovered it as an asset and I acknowledged that the asset was there, but what the, what the sort of hook for me was, was what Bitcoin could do as a protocol, as a new sort of um, infrastructure that things, other things could be built upon. So the way I found it was, you know, it was sort of, um, we did see pitches, you know, in 2012 and 2013, really. Um, my first email about Bitcoin is in 2013 out to a colleague saying, we should really get that deck from that Bitcoin gaming company. By the way, I don't even remember, I don't know what company it was, um, I don't wow. remember the name. I don't have it in my email, but that was my first email about Bitcoin. But wow. then I got really lucky, which was that one of our portfolio companies, um, we were going to be like working with them to support them operationally being like in house with them. And they were working out of a co-working spot. And so I went to set up the first day, like my workstation in this co-working spot. And I saw this, like, you know, this guy across the room that had like, you know, his, his desk was like encumbered with equipment and, um, you know, I kind of wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to sit in the other corner, right? And sort of like just work. But I asked him like, hey, what what are you doing? What are you working on? And he said, you know, well, I'm doing this and I'm also mining Bitcoin. Um, and that's what this equipment is for. And I said, okay, I'm going to sit next to you and try to learn Bitcoin through osmosis. Um, and, you know, it wasn't through osmosis, but I did. And so I kind of got to piggyback um, you know, off of this guy's work while, you know, supporting a, this other company that happened to be sharing the co-working space. And so I think I just got really fortunate um, that, you know, a lot of folks in Bitcoin today and definitely in the early days were just generous with their time and wanted to share what they were doing and why. And so that I, I was a beneficiary of that. Then once I sort of got hooked through that, I dug into the mailing list. And this was very important to my journey. So I wanted to sort of understand where Bitcoin came from, where Satoshi came from, where the people around him, what they were motivated by and the sorts of questions they were asking, what they expected of Bitcoin then, and how that was reflected in what had happened you know, in Bitcoin between 2009 and 2013. Um, and that's been a massive benefit. So it, it's uh, that knowledge and understanding of those early discussions amongst, you know, Satoshi, Hal Finney and, and that group of folks, you know, that, that drives our work even today. Did you start thinking at the time about our economic system, how our financial system is built, um, the debt that we have been accumulating and how Bitcoin is, is sort of trying to address that as a technology network? I thought about it in a different angle. So I was thinking about the financial system from an inclusion and exclusion standpoint, because that's what the, the protocol lends itself to, right? Is allowing a new financial system that um, is opt-in, you know, and opt-out. And I thought that Bitcoin um, protocol looked like FinTech that could include poor people. And that was very interesting to me from a mission perspective. And as a venture capitalist, it's a huge market, right? People that are unbanked or underbanked. And if there's an opportunity to do well while also doing good work in the world, um, you have to grab it. You know, I think that those opportunities, um, especially as significant as the one that Bitcoin presents, it's very rare, right? Even in terms of our lifetime, I think this is you know, the biggest. And so, you know, that was the hook for me. So I do understand Bitcoin, the asset and, um, you know, what it provides, uh, you know, beyond fiat that fiat cannot provide, but I was really compelled by Bitcoin, the technology. And then I saw the asset as a way to align the incentives of disparate stakeholders and as a security 
mechanism for the technology, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Just to get a little bit more personal, um, why did that mean so much to you to embrace something that would provide more financial inclusion? That's a good question, but I don't know that I know the answer to that. Um, I suppose I just think that I see, you know, that all people um, have a dignity that they do, you know, and and, um, a right to freedom. And that includes, you know, the ability to engage in commerce um, and, you know, to be able to to store value, right? And, um, And to be able to transact in a global economy. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know, but it's just part of my makeup that I think that all people should have dignity and freedom. Um, And so I I think that inclusive finance is a necessary component of that. This episode is also brought to you by one of my favorite companies in the space, Fold. Fold is the easiest and most fun way to earn Bitcoin on everything you do. So if you're interested in Bitcoin, but you really don't know where to start, Fold is the perfect app. There's a daily wheel that you can spin every day for free. And you can earn Bitcoin, free Satoshi. Seriously, there's no catch. And one of my other favorite things is their card, the Fold debit card. You can actually earn Bitcoin back on every single purchase. So make sure to download the Fold app today. There's a referral link in the description. So did you have a transformation in terms of just saying, okay, I want to go forward and specifically focus venture capital on Bitcoin? Because there aren't many companies like Stillmark, right? So how did you build the company? So, so when I found it in 2013, I thought what I would do was get smart on the tech and then convince the folks I worked with that they wanted to also be involved in Bitcoin and get smart on the tech. Um, and the thing is that the risk reward is just different, right? So if you're, I was a junior VC, I wasn't a leader of the, the firm where I was at in any way. I was, what I did was I led diligence at the firms that I worked at. That was my role on the investment team. Um, and you know, the risk reward ratio is different, right. For someone that's sort of like outside, um, the ruling class and, um, just, you know, the folks I worked with didn't have the appetite to take on that sort of risk and actually very, um, generously minded. I was given the advice from one of my bosses, you know, at least this is too big a risk. Don't risk your career on this. Don't risk your career on Bitcoin. This is like 2014, um, that was probably good advice, you know, probably like most things are not going to work out the way, you know, this did or so far has, um, and he meant well by it. So, but, you know, it was different for me because of my position. And so, um, after several years, I realized that not only were the people I was working with not going to be compelled by Bitcoin within the timeline I needed them to be, but Silicon Valley was also not going to be. You know, and that was because it was flashier to do tokens. Tokens sort of broke us out of this, um, you know, need to get a return by increasing the enterprise value of a portfolio company, right? Tokens allow you, it's an escape hatch, right? How can you make money without, um, you know, doing the work, right? That's, I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that tokens do. Um, And so I also, in addition to not compelling my own team, I was not going to compel Silicon Valley to be interested in Bitcoin the way that I thought they should be and not on the time frame, you know, that, that I had for myself. And so um, then what I needed to see was the protocol mature to a state where an economy could really be built on top of it. And so what that meant for me was SegWit to be activated and adopted so that we could see a more mature, robust lightning network. And companies built using Lightning Network or on Lightning Network. And so 2017, um, you know, of course, was important for that. 2018 and the adoption that happened of SegWit then that year was important. And so in 2019, I launched Stillmark, um, you know, with, like I said, with the backing of, you know, some of the most formative people in the Bitcoin space. Just out of curiosity, can we dig a little bit more into that idea of tokens and why you are so focused on Bitcoin? Because I feel like now we have a lot of big Bitcoin voices in the space who come out and they say that one of the problems with the other cryptocurrencies is they're VC backed and essentially they're, they're going to be deemed securities and someone could be left holding the bag and they're a much bigger risk. Um, what is your take from all of your experience with venture capital? Do you, are, are, are you 
pro these other cryptocurrencies and investing and taking that risk? Or do you really caution people against it? Well, first I'll say we were really early at looking at other tokens. So I believe that we, um, the firm I was at at the time, I believe that we were, you know, like the second or third VC firm to look at token investing. So we looked at, um, through my um, suggestion, we looked at the second ever ICO, which was made safe. I think that was 2014. Um, And we looked at the ICOs that happened after that. And there was a lot of interesting ideas, by the way, and those ICOs were um, in many ways more responsible than what we see today, more honest, more transparent. Um, but we just didn't, you know, we we didn't get conviction around anything. And, uh, you know, just what was happening in Bitcoin was more important. And also you needed to be, it was so dynamic and it is still today that you really need to be focused 24 seven on Bitcoin to really um, understand the tech and the ecosystem. And so, you know, that's sort of my base. Now that aside, I think that Token investing is just, it's, um, I wouldn't define it as a venture capital practice. And so I don't think someone with expertise in venture capital is necessarily any better, um, you know, informed towards token investing than anyone else would be. Um, And so it doesn't, there wasn't a clear path for me to contribute there. But also, like I said um, a couple minutes ago, you know, I think that when you see an opportunity to do, um, you know, to be a part of something that's important positively for culture and for others, at, while at the same time, um, you know, making money, you, uh, there's few of those opportunities and Bitcoin um, was really that. And so I think to be distracted by tokens, for me, it would feel more like short-term thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bitcoin's all about the long-term. Yeah. So Bitcoin's about the long-term, right. And so I think that that makes sense for a venture capital firm where, you know, funds run for 10 years and we're, you know, my hope and intention with Stillmark is that it's, uh, you know, a firm that's around for decades and not for a specific trend. So where are the areas within Bitcoin of the most uh, momentum in terms of growth and, and the areas that are really seeking venture capital that you're looking at? We look at two buckets, um, one of which you've been um, you know, focused on in our conversation so far today. So first bucket is going to be just around financialization of Bitcoin asset and how to make Bitcoin a more valuable, easier to use, less, you know, frictionful asset. Um, And I understand for many people, by the way, it's very easy to hold and to use, to store Bitcoin without any additional support. Um, You know, I'm now thinking more about, you know, the masses and people that are not full-time in Bitcoin. So we invest in companies like Akaza, for example, that helps anyone and everyone have bank level security for their Bitcoin through um, multi-sig, but you can use Casa without understanding multi-sig, right? You don't even have to know the word. Um, So we find value there. Our most recent investment, which is not announced yet, um, is in the same space. So it's not a competitor to Casa. I don't mean it that way, but it's in the same space in that it helps Bitcoin the asset um, advance in terms of what it can do. And so we're thinking about, for instance, how can you, um, you know, use your Bitcoin to, uh, to get a mortgage, for example, mm-hmm. um, or on the flip side of that, if you're storing your Bitcoin um, with someone else, if you have Bitcoin on an exchange, how can you be sure that they're holding the Bitcoin? And so uh, those are the sorts of things that fit into the first bucket. The second bucket is that we're looking at companies taking advantage of the technology itself and specifically for fund one, which we're investing from now, we're looking at companies building on Lightning Network or integrating Lightning Network into their business. Um, and those companies, of course, are you know are also um, at an inflection point um, for many reasons. It, you know, most obviously in Q4 and in the last couple months, we've seen many more people have access to Lightning. And And then on the other side um, of the spectrum, in terms of where the protocol is going, we also see on the roadmap that, you know, incredibly important advancements are happening like Lightning Labs Tarot, which will have Mm -hmm. an impact for companies integrated with Lightning Network. 
Okay. I was actually going to save that question for later because we sort of brought it up when we were at the Bitcoin conference, but can you tell people um, what Tarot is and how um, it's going to be allowing stable coins, right? To sort of empower the lightning network and, and sort of integrate fiat with, with Bitcoin. So Tarot is, I think of, um, you know, Tarot in two different ways. So first Tarot is the ability to exchange other digital assets on the Lightning Network. So to exchange, for instance, Tether to get instant Tether on the Lightning Network so that you can have, you can trade it peer to peer instantly and nearly for free across, across the globe. So that's what Taro is, you know, from a product perspective. But fundamentally what Taro is, is a response to feedback um, in Lightning's adoption especially in emerging markets. So in Q4, Lightning Network, of course, drove Bitcoin's adoption in El Salvador. We've also seen Lightning Network adopted in other emerging markets. And the feedback gained from that was that the technology, the protocol was fantastic and great and having access to a global economy and easier access to exchange, to facilitate exchange purchase um, and sales, even in your local offline market was was important. but that Bitcoin's volatility is difficult to tolerate when your monthly expenses are sort of even with your monthly income. And so if you're making $400 a month and each month you have to spend $390 to $410, um, Bitcoin's volatility is just, it's impossible to tolerate. And, and you know that feedback is clear. And so I think tarot is a response to that. And so I'm really sort of excited to see this very tight adoption feedback and infrastructure loop. Um, And it makes me even more bullish for Bitcoin, um, you know, to see it feedback from end users being incorporated. You know, it's interesting because I see some Bitcoiners on Twitter, they're so anti-stable coins. And then others say that this is actually how we're going to gain mass adoption. And I'm just kind of curious, can you weed through some of that and clarify, like, what do you want people to know about stable coins and Bitcoin's adoption or growth? Well, I suppose that just, you know, coming from a privileged place, I don't need stable coins. I could work with just Bitcoin but there's a world that exists beyond me and I acknowledge the rest, you know, other people's experiences. And so just because I can tolerate Bitcoin's volatility doesn't mean that the rest of the world can. And the point of Bitcoin or why I fell in love with Bitcoin was because it was meant to be, you know, an open opportunity to participate in global finance. And so to make that easier for people, including poor people, this is a solution. Stable coins provide a solution. And maybe it's just an interim solution until, um, you know, Bitcoin is how, um, you know, goods and services are denominated. And we're not there yet. Um, But there's still poor people in the world, and they can still benefit from Bitcoin um, through benefiting through Bitcoin's protocols, including Lightning Network, if they have access to a stable coin. And it doesn't have to be, from my perspective, and I've talked about this a lot, it could also be stable channels, um, stable lightning channels. Um, This is all fine, but we have to acknowledge that there's a variety of people in the world, not all of whom can tolerate Bitcoin's volatility and that should not exclude them from the network. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about institutions coming into Bitcoin? What are you seeing? And what is your answer to a question that I get often, which is why aren't the Googles and the Facebooks and the really big tech companies that clearly must understand Bitcoin because many of their CEOs mention that they hold it or, or accumulate it? What, what's happening with institutions? Well, I think that you know, people have to first manage their core business before expanding out from that. And so I think that we're seeing that. And we also know that institutions are slower to adopt anything, let alone something that introduces a new paradigm like Bitcoin, um, you know, just by the nature of their size. And that's the advantage that startups have, right? So I think we're seeing that, but I do hear with relative um, frequency that, you know, a CEO of this large financial institution is 10%, 10% of his or her personal wealth is in Bitcoin. Um, but yet I know that institution has not done anything publicly towards Bitcoin. And so there is a break, I think, between um, what leaders are recognizing exists in Bitcoin asset and the technology and 
than what they're advancing within their organization. Um, you know, but I think having examples like MicroStrategy um, or Fidelity and others, and having examples of startups scaling to be, um, you know, peers with these sorts of institutions is helping to drive a sense of urgency, I hope. And we're seeing that pick up a bit, at least through what folks are internally testing. I wanted to get your take because one of the things that I've heard in that same discussion is just, well, people are actually, they are accumulating, they're buying, there are countries buying, we just don't know it. There are companies buying that we just don't know. But I, I, my argument is we would probably see that reflected in the price. The price would be going up and we are in this very, very choppy period that's obviously impacted by the greater, greater macroeconomic picture. And now we've come into a situation where we've printed so much money. We need to raise interest rates yet. We can't raise interest rates into a slowing economy. And like everything just feels like it could collapse tomorrow or at the same time it could shoot up and we could have an all time high. I don't know. Like what, what is your take on all of this, this environment that we're in and sort of the price that's reflected in it? Well, I think that, you know, well, so first of all, um, you know, I'm always wanting to make sure that we understand what we know and where our expertise is and not going, you know, too far beyond on that. So our portfolio, we don't hold Bitcoin, um, you know, directly. So we're experts on company growth, private company growth, um, and, you know, sort of how companies can work to create value based on Bitcoin. Um, now, I think I'm less of an expert, much less of an expert, not an expert on Bitcoin's price. And I think Bitcoin, you know, in the short term is very hard to predict. Bitcoin in the long term, though, shows that as adoption grows, so too does price. Um, and, and so I'm bullish, of course, on price because, you know, history is a, informs that, but also because I understand how adoption will be driven by some of um, the technological advancements that we're seeing, as well as the companies that exist in our portfolio and even beyond that. And so while I can't predict, for instance, the impact of tarot on Bitcoin's price in the short term, I think in the long term, it's certainly a driver. Um, you know, I, I said there's many examples. Uh, Lightning Labs is a portfolio company, by the way, I should say. Um, there's many examples of that, um, you know, in our portfolio. But as Bitcoin gets into more people's hands, the price has tended to, to rise although it's not always reflected in the immediate term. And so, you know, my perspective is one of patience. So Stillmark doesn't have Bitcoin on its balance sheet? Right. How come? Right. Well, because our expenses are match our, um, so the way venture capital funds work, I think this isn't obvious um, to many people, but our management fees are pretty low. And so, uh, you know, we are um, aligned with founders and that the way that we really make money is when companies grow in terms of enterprise value and um, when founders are rewarded for that, we're matched up with them. Um, management fees are generally, the market is 2% of assets under management and our expenses are, you know, very close to that. So it's not, it's not, I think a lot of people think that we have, you know, this money sitting around that we have discretion over uh -huh. on how, and that's not the case. We, you know, the money that um, people entrust us with is to direct towards Bitcoin companies. And then, you know, it's founders discretion for how to put that money to best use to grow their business. And sometimes founders will include Bitcoin on their balance sheet as a way to do that. And sometimes they, they won't, and we can advise there, but it's not something that we would do directly on behalf of our investors. But we can help our investors figure out how to most responsibly um, accumulate Bitcoin and how to safely secure Bitcoin. And so, you know, we feel really confident that the sorts of folks in our network um, that we have, you know, can figure out how to hold um, Bitcoin themselves. We can support that and we should not be charging them fees for it. Well, I know that you've worked with a lot of companies and founders. Is there a story, um, a specific company that you're most proud of or a narrative that you could share that really encapsulates um, some of the work that you feel like brings you the most fulfillment? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, we work with just such incredible founders. Um, 
Yeah. So what's a good example? Oh my God. There's so many. I'm like fighting with myself over who I should talk about. Um, Okay, well, here's a different story. So maybe I'm trying to think of who would be less familiar to your audience. One of the recent companies that we invested in um, was a gaming company. And um, it's a gaming company where the, where the leaders are not religiously Bitcoin, but see Bitcoin, interestingly, as a tool to help drive value for their end users. So their religion is not Bitcoin, the religion is best experience for our end users, which incredible, right? So I'll tell their story a little bit. It's it's indicative of a new trend in entrepreneurship we're seeing. So whereas in the past, most Bitcoin founders have really come from the Bitcoin space, starting in late 2021, we saw founders that were experts in their vertical learn about Bitcoin and decide that Bitcoin could help drive their vertical forward. So this company that I'm talking about is called Pink Frog, Pink Frog Studios. Um, The founders are based in Finland and and Germany, and they come from King, which is a major studio, one of the top. And not just do they come from King, but they were the leaders, the executive producers of Candy Crush. So they grew a game from zero to 100 million monthly active users and a top line of a billion dollars in revenue. So, you know, these guys can do whatever they want. They can also coast, right? But what they want to do is build a new game um, focused on user-generated content for, um, you know, millennials and Gen Z. And they think the best game will allow peer-to-peer payments and rewards via Lightning Network. You know, wow. and so that's really interesting, isn't it? That people that are not, um, you know, like religiously Bitcoin or that aren't 24 seven thinking about how Bitcoin, um, you know, helps fix the economy, for example, see Bitcoin as a tool that can provide value for their user base. Um, and what's interesting to me about this company is not just the opportunity for the company um, to grow, hopefully in a way similar to Candy Crush, um, but it's also an opportunity for a whole new group of, of people to learn about Bitcoin, mm-hmm. um, you know, through a, a, through a beautiful game that they're not, you know, that they're, um, yeah. where they can safely, they, they feel comfortable in the way that they discover Bitcoin. Um, and so maybe that's an example for you of a company yeah. that is making a change that or, or has the opportunity to make a change and advance Bitcoin, um, you know, that might be less traditional than what we've seen in Bitcoin entrepreneurship in the past. Wow. That's really interesting. Um, Also, I'm curious, you know, from your vantage point, since you kind of see these companies that are emerging and that need funding, what do you think is missing? Like, what do you think if a, if a founder or company kind of tackled this specific issue, they would really find a lot of opportunity in terms of investment and, um, and, and, and maybe the ability to grow. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great question. Um, well, okay. So I do, I have things in mind, but I'm not going to share them mostly because we don't like to be prescriptive. So we are, um, you know, what we're looking for is to back the best decision makers in, in significant market spaces. And so we, you know, when we join a team, it's not to lead the team in any way. It's not to, it's, it's just to support founders. And so we want to sort of be working with people where, um, you know, like I said, at the beginning of our conversation, they're kind of like fine on their own, you yeah. know, but can they get there faster with more resources? Maybe. And so, and maybe with the support of our network, for example, or maybe we can share some lessons with them um, that we've acquired over the past, you know, decade of working with founders. Um, and so, you know, I have, we have things in mind that we'd like to see happen. Um, you know, we're really keen on various pieces of infrastructure right now. Um, and that's reflected in the, in the portfolio and a few of the things I described. So like the gaming investment, for instance, is like an outlier for us. We're doing a lot of infrastructure investment, um, you know, but really we're just looking for people that understand the protocols 
to understand what you can do with the protocols and what you can't do also. And so we're looking to build a company and um, design a roadmap that matches up with that. And whether those people are presenting an idea that we've already had or something that's totally novel to us, um, you know, it's just about if it's, you know, a, a, a large enough market, right? Because we're, yeah, we're venture capitalists. We're not, you know, sort of, um, you know, this is not like a donation. It's an investment. Um, but if they're targeting that market in a way that makes sense with what is unique and inherent to Bitcoin technology, um, you know, and then if the founders, frankly, are people that we could imagine, um, you know, being able to recruit incredible talents, are these people that we ourselves would want to work with? Could we imagine them um, recruiting the best and brightest? And that's who we try to fund. Awesome. All right. Well, as I start to wrap up, uh, just curious, you know, I, I feel like venture capital feels like a very just competitive, um, industry where you just have to be on your game all the time, high functioning, a lot of people trying to, you know, outwork each other. What's your biggest lesson? Like if you could talk to, uh, your younger self before you really went into the industry, um, what would you, what would you tell her? Um, well, I think that's also not something. So those are, that's our, those are our trade secrets. Um, I think, you know, the thing about venture capital that might not be obvious, I think, is that it's, I think it's less competitive and more collaborative hmm. because there's, um, you know, other VCs. So we're never, Stillmark is never going to be um, the only funder of a company across that company's um, lifespan. So, you know, the people that we invest with are like an extension of our team. Um, you know, and that's sort of how I think about it versus thinking about it competitively. Um, I, you know, I think about who, who should we add to our team um, to support this type of company? I see that my cat has joined in so the background. Um, so, that, you know, that's sort of how we think about it. Who do we need to recruit to, to help this founder face the next set of challenges that they're going to see? It's really more, much more collaborative and cooperative um, than competitive. We're just, we're sort of all on the same team. That's great. Well, to wrap it up, what are you watching for? What are your biggest questions when it comes to just Bitcoin in the near future? Well, I'm, I'm very keen to see how founders will build to take advantage of what Tarot presents. How will founders be thinking about a st instant tether on lightning and its relevance in emerging markets? And what sort of new utility in Bitcoin and Lightning can that unlock? Where I'm, I'm really keen to see what people will come up with, and um, you know, really bullish on that. Awesome. Anything else you want to share, or anywhere you want to direct people to get more information? Sure. So we're we have a website, stillmark.com, and I'd say, um, and I sh I should always say this at the start and end of every conversation. We're really um, keen to work with founders and meet them very early. People don't have to come to us with like a perfect pitch. Um, we're really comfortable with the messy pieces of early stage startups, and so you know you don't have to reach out to us once you're pitch is perfect or once everything is sort of all the T's are crossed and I's dotted, we're really comfortable to get to know folks way before that that is true. And so founders can reach out directly to me um, or on our website, we have a link for folks to ping us as well.